Thank you for sticking with me for the demo. I'm going to be running quickly through a demonstration and some tips on the CMDB data manager. I'm going to be using a Utah personal developer instance that I requested from developer.servicenow.com. This demo will work with Utah, Tokyo, San Diego, or Rome instances. And as always, of course, you should always try these things out in a non-prod environment before doing it in production. I'm just going to be leveraging the demo data that is part of the PDI, but I did have to do a couple setups which I'm not having in the video. First, and importantly, I had to follow the steps in the Migrate to CSDM Lifecycle Standards page here in the product documentation. As mentioned before, this is a necessary step to map your CIs to the CSDM Lifecycle uh, in order to then be able to create um, retire, archive, and delete policies against them. And you'll, you'll see the evidence of that once we get in the demo. The second thing is if you are on a Utah instance, only Utah, as this was just introduced, you also need to do a lifecycle um, retirement custom definition. So there are baseline ones, and all you have to do is just set one to active. And I did the configuration item one so that it would cover the entire CMDB. As you can see, there are other ones in here that you can play with that are targeted for specific classes with different conditions. But for our purposes today, it was just sufficient to go ahead and set just one of these rules active that covered the entire CMDB. So with those two tasks, and let's just take a quick look at the lifecycle mapping, again, with 143 rules that are part of the baseline, these are sufficient for our demo purposes. Um, you would just activate it following the instructions in the documentation. With those actions taken, the next thing is we need to have a plan. And to set your plan, a great place to start is the CI class manager. So if we go to our CI class manager, an important concept is to understand how the hierarchy of the CMDB. I had just mentioned I only activated a single rule that covers the CMDB, which then immediately covers every table, every class underneath it. For a moment, I'll get into um, exclusion rules, but let's look at, for example, service. If we look at service as a class, you can see that there are 42 service records, but Underneath that, as a child class, there is a class called Application Service Group. This is going to matter in a moment. But the important thing is to come up with a plan to target the exact CIs, perhaps by class, of what you want to um, archive, retire, and delete, or attest. So let's assume that we have a plan, and now it's time to start working with our data manager. So we go to the CMDB data manager, and you can see that I've already created a couple policies. Before we create one in our demo, let's talk about excluded CIs. So we have a function here in the dashboard where we can go to the excluded CIs list. And you can see, of course, there are none currently existing. I can click the edit exclusion list where I can choose a policy type and a set of configuration. So let's say I want to not retire any of my services. So I can come in there and say policy type is retire, class is a service. And if I run that filter, then if we look down in the count, sure enough, we see there's that same 42 services that we saw. But and this is very important, is notice the operator is is a, class is a service. What, me, what that is doing is taking the class that you selected and any of the child classes underneath it. So we see application service group, that one record is included. If instead of is a, I choose is and rerun the filter, of course, after selecting service again, 
we will see that we get the 41 records minus that child record. So something just very important to think about whenever you're working with filters against CI classes, whether you want is a to include the children or whether you want is for just that single class. So with those records, I could select, for example, all of them by checking the box there. And then down here, I can click a plus to add them to my list of excluded CIs. Notice it only took the first page of 20 records that I could see. So I would have to continue to go to the next page to grab the next 20 um, and, and conclude doing this uh, for all the CIs that I want to exclude. Keep in mind that you would have to do this for each policy type that you want to exclude those CIs and for, of course, each CI. There's another challenge here, which is uh, beyond having to do this uh, over and over for each policy type, note that this is exclusively selecting individual CIs. You are not defining a condition that is dynamic and therefore would apply to future CIs. So if I do this work to add my 41 services and tomorrow I create a new service, I have to remember to come in and add that new service to these excluded CI lists. Otherwise, that could be targeted accidentally by my policies. So personally, I don't actually use my excluded CIs function. And so let's go back to the data manager and create a policy, and I'll show you what I do instead. So we're going to go to view policies, and we see that I've already created an archive and a retire policy, which we'll talk about in a moment. But let's go ahead and create a new policy. So we're going to give it a name, tire. Um, SAP servers. In the description field, I want to show something that's just a little gotcha to be aware of. So I put in 10 digits there, and then let's just copy and paste that a whole bunch of times so we can see that we've added a ton of text. It looks like it will continue to expand, but this field will actually truncate at 100 characters in the baseline. So just a little enhancement you might want to consider increasing the size of that field from the baseline size. Needs review is default checked. You can uncheck it if you would like the policy to uh, generate tasks that are just automatically approved and processed. Personally, I like to see that task. I'd like to see the results of my policy as there can be a delta between the preview uh, CIs that might meet that condition and the actual CIs that are part of the task that is generated by this process. And so by being able to review it, that just lets me double check my work before I actually commit that action. If I do have the needs review, then I can choose what group that task is going to be assigned to. If I don't have any of these attributes configured on my CIs, that's okay. The task will be just will be generated. It just won't have an assignment group, and you can then manually set that assignment group to whomever you want. We're going to go ahead and choose a retire policy type because, of course, remember, we have to follow the life cycle. You have to retire first before you can archive or delete. Down at the bottom, we see the subflow also needs to be selected. This does give you the future functionality of being able to create custom subflows, but for right now, of course, we're just going to select the baseline one. So in the middle, we then have our conditions. And so I said that I want to retire SAP server. So maybe I'm going to say class is a server, for example. And name contains SAP. And we can run that filter and we get eight records. Let's go ahead and preview that. And the important thing here to note about this preview is there is a related list condition that is part of that filter condition, which means you cannot edit this filter. But you can remove that safely without affecting the preview. That related list condition just ties this these records back to that policy. But if I want to play with this filter to find exactly the records I want to target to you know, go back and update my policy, that's a great trick. So you can just click on that condition to remove it. And now I have access to use my filter builder uh, and, and uh, edit that filter as I desire. The second thing to note is that on a retire policy, it automatically ends is not end of life for the life cycle stage. So 
again, it's looking for ones that are installed and operational or operational and in use. Note also that I have personalized my list view here to include my lifecycle stage, stage status, install status, and operational status fields just so I can easily identify the records that I'm targeting. So we see that we want, let's say, to get rid of these two AIX servers. And I'm going to use this as an example to explain how I use filters instead of the excluded CI list. So if we go back to our policy, I only want those two AIX servers. I could go up here and say class is AIX server, but I'm just going to, as an example, say instead class is not Windows server. And so the point being is this is a way that you can create dynamic exclusions on your policies without having to use that exclusions list where you're creating specific CIs. This allows me to cover today's Windows servers and Windows servers in the future. If we run that filter, notice we only now get two records that match that condition. So with our policy ready to go, let's go ahead and save it. We can then preview it, and then we can publish it. Don't forget that last step. Do not leave your policies in a previewed but not published state. Otherwise, of course, they won't execute. Now, for demo purposes, we're going to quickly go ahead and kick off the schedule. So I've already got a bookmark here for scheduled jobs that start with CMDB Data Manager. And in there, of course, we see our retire policy processor. And I'm just going to set that to a prior date so that that will automatically run. Let's refresh our list. OK, there we go. So now we can go back to our data manager dashboard. And sure enough, we can see that there's an open task that was generated by that job. That job normally runs nightly. Let's open up that task and see what we got. So it generated the task because we said we want to uh, approve it. It does not assign it to an assignment group because I don't have the managed group attribute filled in. But I can see there are my two related AIX servers. So if that's what I want to retire, then I can go ahead and approve this task. Now watch what happens to that related list once it approves it. So we see it's approved. It automatically went to close complete. It runs very quickly with only two records. If we reload this form, you'll see that that related list of CIs is gone. It's a many-to-many -many table that sits between the task and a processing table. But once that is processed, those CIs are gone. They have now been updated. Let's go back to our filter here, refresh this list, and we can see that they no longer match that condition. If we get rid of that life cycle is not end of life, sure enough, we can see that those two AIX servers now are end of life retired. Let's go ahead and close that, come back here. Let's go back to our data manager dashboard one more time. We'll use our favorites to get back there. And just take a quick note that if I hover over that description field, you can see that it is only truncated at 100 characters. So just that little tip that, uh, again, that description field looks like it's large, but it is not. Uh, it, it, in the baseline, it's only 100 characters. Let's go ahead and open up that archive policy that I had already created. And in this case, for simplicity's sake, I have it just set to archive any configuration items. Now, again, this has a hidden condition. So if I run the filter, notice only two records match. Which two records? Of course, the two that are in life cycle stage end of life, because notice now the condition is not is not end of life, but is equal to end of life. So these are my two systems that are retired and now could be archived by this new policy. That's what I want. We don't have to publish this because it's already sitting in a published state, but what we do need is to go ahead and kick off that archive policy schedule job. So we'll do the same little trick for our demo and force that to run. Refresh our list, make sure that executed, excellent. All right, so now we should be able to come back here to our dashboard one more time. And sure enough, we see another task that has been created. Open that task up. 
Again, if I didn't want this task, if I just simply wanted to execute that archive, I can uncheck that box that says requires approval uh, or requires review. We see our two related records here. Let's go ahead and approve this. And again, we can monitor the task by reloading the form there. And we see something again, that's a little bit unique to uh, Utah. If you're, for example, on a prior edition like uh, San Diego, you will see this task just go to close complete. Here, it's actually being aware of the fact that they are now queued to be archived, but have not yet actually been archived. So my two configuration item records are still associated because the process isn't done. The first step is, the next step still needs to happen, which is that uh, they need to be archived. If we go take a look, you can find those pending archives in this archive job execution chunks table. And sure enough, we see right there is that pending record with the two sysids of those two servers that are pending. We can see one that I had run in a prior day here where those have already been archived. The job that does this processing runs um, on the hour, every hour in a baseline configuration. So of course you might have to check if it's the same in your environment, but with that job, when it runs, it will go ahead and archive those. And since we don't wanna sit here and wait for that, then let's just go ahead, whoops, and let's take a look at those other two that I had archived in the past. So one last look, if we go look at archive servers, notice the table name. These were servers that I had archived, but they are in the AR underscore CMDB CI server table, right? So this is the archive version. However, I can still look at those records. I can still interact with those records, but they're all read only. Down at the bottom, I do have the ability to restore if I wanted to return this back to the CIs, uh, to the regular CMDB if I had accidentally archived something um, uh, that I didn't intend to. One last thing I wanna cover in our demo before we wrap up is if we go back to our data manager, back to our policies, when I'm done, or if I don't want something to occur, I can also, of course, delete the policy, but I personally like to keep a record of my policies so I can open up a policy that is published and I can simply click deactivate. And now I have that policy saved where I could reactivate it or edit it but it is no longer going to execute and generate those tasks. So I hope you found that demo uh, enlightening and helpful. And uh, if you would like to leave uh, comments on the video, of course, on other topics, perhaps that would uh, we can uh, go ahead and do videos to dig deeper into the archive or attestation processes as well. Get to subscribe to our channel, hit that notification bell, and let us know in the comments what other topics you would like to see for us to cover in future sessions. So thanks again on behalf of Volteo Digital and myself, Aaron Smith. See you next time.